late 80s. Georgia was great. We were developing country. Everything was on track. We had money. We were the first in the union. Stalin was a Georgian. Shevard Nads was the foreign minister of USR. But where there is money, there are bandits, corruption, the strong and the weak, the rich and the not so rich. Naturally, there are dissatisfied people, and of course the government is to be blamed for everything, and it must be changed. One of the party's pretenders to power has connections with the military and seems to be a decent guy in general. A military coup. The best solution. All the corrupt and thugs in jail. Wealth for the poor. Rights for the oppressed. Everything according to the classics. We're going to do everything right. The military was brought down, the right people were brought in. The government was removed. Gam Sakurdia was made president, and it seems that everything must become right at once. Two years passed. The jobs haven't gotten any better. The gangsters haven't gone anywhere. The inflation has only been running at double-digit rates, and the kickbacks and bribes have increased. This is bullshit. And the people told Gam Sakurdia. You've told us all kinds of lies. We're going to overthrow you. You've got it all wrong. Wait a minute, it's all Russia. Now we're going to bury all the loose ends with her and get on with our lives. Signs a decree about the end of trade relations with Russia in 92 and sat down to wait. And a year goes by and nothing good happens again. Only inflation is already four figure and we can't see the end of it. We don't know what to do. Let's find somebody who's not such an asshole and knows what to do. Edik, come and save us. You seem like a diplomatic man, and you inspire trust and respect. So do something. The military is already feeding off the hands of the military and has political promises carved with a knife on the backs of enemies. Down with corruption, corrupt scum, the West is strong. Shevard Nads to the presidency, comes to power by the end of 1992. Now we will live. And in 95, Edward Ambrosievich came to the presidency and decided to fulfill his promises. Only it turned out that corruption was about the closest circle of the government. The military takes and gives kickbacks to the police and does not issue permits to builders for free, nor does it issue permits for trade. And in general, it is hard to spit anywhere and not get into a place where they do not take money or money by mouth or on the hand. If you start prescribing your own rules, they'll shoot you, blow up your car, or just beat with a tire iron in the crosswalk. If you don't fight back, you'll have people on a pitchfork in a year or so. It's not hard to make inflammatory speeches from manifestos, but you have to know how to get industry off the ground, and you have to get the money from somewhere. They have stopped trading with the buggers, and in Zurich, Georgian peaches have not really taken off, and in Paris, homemade wine in plastic cans also only comes with a surcharge. There are resources, but it is necessary to extract them, and they have already managed to ruin everything. Even the Persian oil is bought in Europe. We would like to install a pipeline for transit, but we have no money. And people gradually began to guess that they were bullshitting again, and that Georgia does not even smell of foreign countries. And they were beginning to ask, where's the money, where's the work, where's the rise in the economy, guys relax, everything is on track, bands with Levka are on their way, taxes have been collected there, three dry cargo ships of freshly baked goods have been sent to California, and they're really coming. We'll close the budget holes, build a new paradise, and it'll be great from all sides. And they elect Shevardnads for a second term. And White Fox came in 2000 for his second term as president. And he didn't lie about the money trucks coming in 1995. He only borrowed the money from the IMLF. It succeeded in closing the current holes, it succeeded in getting re-elected, and the people calmed down. But the problem is still there, the debt is there. But the production in the country in general is still fucked up. And people lived happily ever after. They even laid a project for a pipeline from the Caspian Sea to the Black Sea. There was a festivity with the presidents of Azerbaijan, Turkey and Iran. And even advisors from the USA came. They drank some champagne, received some dough and went on their way. And they started to trade with Russia under the table and GDP began to grow slowly. But because of the increase in production. But people are impatient and there is always something to hang on to. The West says it is a fucking idea to fraternize with Russia, and the corruption does not go anywhere, even after two assassination attempts on the president. Now they are demanding a bribe there. In short, we are tired of it, and in general for eight years, we could have done something better.
and we have a new charismatic leader. He wants to go to the West, he says he will join the EU and we will deal with corruption. It will be a paradise on earth with gardens and roses. So young, handsome, and with roses. Straight to the government house, Akashvili began to fight fiercely against the corporation. The people rejoiced. All of a sudden, money came out of nowhere. Presidential palaces and incredible city projects started being built all around us. And everything was so beautiful that your eyes were watering with amazement. But still some villains appeared and started shouting, all this was just a fake innuendo. The villains were dispersed. The main villain, nicknamed Boris, was deprived of his citizenship and political ambition. But it turned out that the villains weren't bullshit. And the main one of them, Evanishvili Bidzina, nicknamed Boris, was right. Those utopian cities, Mikhail Nikolaevich's projects, were unprofitable forever, and their price tag was like cast iron. And the architecture of the Italian architects' tuned palaces and galleries fit into the landscape like gay jokes in Dutch bars. In general, the love story of Ivanishvili and Sakashvili deserves separate attention. Vidzina Krikarevich returned to Georgia in 2003, Mikhail Nikolaevich in 1995. Boris was watching what Misha was doing for a long time and did not agree with him in many respects. Although at the beginning of his career, he even supported Misha with money. As they say about $1 billion were allocated to support the beginning of the government. Even after the election, Saakashvili party Boris tried to protest. But people did not hear about the lawlessness of Misha. Then in 2012, Boris said, I'm applying for the premiership. But Saakashvili saw Ivanishvili as a very uncomfortable person who sees more, has his own position, and has money for political activities. And just in case he decided to deprive him of citizenship, at the same time to fine him for $90 million for bribing voters. Boris decided not to tolerate such treatment. Although he had money and French and Russian citizenship, it would have been possible to get by. But the big industrialist, owner of Georgian holding Gruzimittal, Russian Credit Bank, Impex Bank, and other equally successful businesses, did not become a patient. And he invested a lot of his personal funds in the development of Georgia through the Carter Foundation. Just think of repairing and rebuilding of theaters, ballets, philharmonic societies, music and cultural centers, museums and cathedrals, construction and reconstruction of sports training centers, stadiums and monuments of cultural heritage, buying and handing over 400 tractors for agriculture, a program to save 440 varieties of Georgian vines and dozens of fruit crops, financing agricultural, medical and health programs, road construction, and just a fucking lot more. In short, Bidzina Ivanishvili's clarity would have been signed by everyone who knew. As a result, Boris decided to take up the fight and managed to bring the Georgian Dream Party, which he had organized, to the majority in the parliament in 2014. A year later, the Georgian Dream candidate was already sitting in the presidential seat. Immediately after the presidential elections, the court returned the citizenship to Boris. The details of Saakashvili's affairs became public, and he had to return to Ukraine. Where, by a strange coincidence, after the return of the certified expert on the subject of revolution, there was a maiden and a change of power. By the way, under Poroshenko, he was in power for a year. Then he was stripped of his citizenship and Saakashvili went to France. Under Zelensky, he returned, got his Ukrainian citizenship back, hung around for a year, and was again stripped of his citizenship and deported to his home country, where he was arrested. In general, the history of the first persons of the Georgian state is interesting. Shevard Nads, who was close friends with Gorbachev, and even as foreign minister, began the process of troop withdrawal from Akhenistan and initiated nuclear disarmament with the states. These issues had been dangling for years, and for them it was possible to get a write-off of all the external debts of the USR and to annex a couple of small British colonies in return. And the USR, represented by Shevard Nads, got nothing a tin of goodwill, for which Gorbachev did not even go to jail. But he initiated the thaw in the Cold War with the West. Or Saakashvili, who was educated at the Ukrainian Institute of International Relations of Kiev State University, named after Taras Shevchenko, and as a fellow of the U.S. State Department, was sent to study at Columbia University. Living abroad and returned to his homeland only in 1995, purposefully to lead the ship, floating without him in the strongly rocking sea, he arrived, rocked it, made some kickback money from the construction and went back to Ukraine where, oh my god, what a surprise, in the year of his return, there was a maiden. Or the current president Salome, 
It's great when your president loves and knows her people so well that for the first time in her life, after her parents emigrated to France, she comes to her homeland when she is well over 50 years old. Digging a little deeper into her biography, she has never held a position during her life that would imply independent decision-making. Secretaries for ministries in France and NATO in the EU and the USA, and even in missions to the Central African Republic. All secretarial positions from France to the United States. The man does as he is told, and by those who brought him up. And this is the civilized West with its exclusive interests. How Saakashvili, who at the beginning of his career received from Ivanishvili a financial assistance of about $1 billion, deprived him of his citizenship by his decree. Just as Bidzina had helped Salom's self-nomination, after the March rallies he heard about the ruling party's introduction of the law on foreigners, the opinion of Salom, and the support of the nation, the next day went to the government building with demands to dismiss the government, where the majority of votes are from the Georgian train of Anishvili. In 30 years, only Marjolashvili sat quietly. When conducting a study of George's ruling elite of all the persons, only Ivanishvili is credible, although he has never been the president. When the ruling party Georgian Dream came to power, the mega-projects of Saakashvili's sawing off like Lazica, the city, were curtailed Mikhail Nikolaevich's ambitions, could be compared with the ideas of Arab sheiks to create a point of attraction on the continent. But with a couple of reservations, in the UAE all the construction is at their own expense and Georgia on loans from the West. The UAE is a desert with nothing. In Georgia there is nature, where you want to stay even in a tent, the greatest Caucasus mountain lakes, the country washed by the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, drowning in greenery and flowers. Speaking of fighting corruption and GDP growth, Georgia as part of the USR was one of the leading prosperous regions. Between 1913 and 1975 the national income of the country grew almost 90 times. The national income per capita in the 1970s was three-fourths of the average all-union level. The economy was changing from agrarian to industrial to post-industrial. In 1990, the service sector accounted for over 40% of employment, while industry accounted for 27%. In Soviet times, Georgia had a well-developed industry, specializing in the production of food, iron, coal, steel pipes, petroleum products, fertilizers, machine tools, locomotives, and aircraft assembly. From 1992 to 1994, the industrial and transport infrastructure collapsed, and the new monetary unit Larry depreciated. Unemployment reached 20%, and the conflict with Abkhazia reduced the flow of tourists from Russia to zero. Average real wages fell by a factor of 10, and there was mass emigration to Russia, mostly, and the European Union. All in all, more than 1 million people left the country. As a consequence, employment in Georgia fell from 2.8 million to 1.8 million people. After the collapse of the USR, production and services were not restored, and GDP grew mainly due to external injections. As of 2023, Georgia's total external debt is about $22 billion, which is about 60% of the annual GDP. GDP 2003, Forbes in 2013, 17 men debt 2003, 1.5 in 2013, 13.4 Ben Saakashvili won the law on police reform to make it easier to control the movement of borrowed money within the country and to keep the budgets of projects like the oil pipeline from getting too bloated. Georgia has wanted to join the EU for 20 years, but every year it becomes more like a ploy. Georgia is a big and great country, which is everything for choosing where to join and who to be friends with without hanging around at the EU fence for 20 years. Business is the head of everything industry and development within the country. Choose people who know how to do business and not make a career for themselves and you will be happy.